Dear colleagues, it is a big pleasure today to present some of our work on how to make green steel by using hydrogen. And I do this work together with my colleagues, the group leaders Jan Ma and Isnaldi uh, Sousa at my institute and also with Professor Auke Springer, who is also a professor at the University in Aachen. So there are a couple of further great colleagues who contributed to the work and we will present also and highlight their contributions during the presentation. Now when we take a more general view and aim at reducing the energy consumption and the CO2 emissions associated with materials, then we of course do that indirectly through making high strength materials, magnetic devices for electrical engines for instance, or higher efficiency high temperature turbine alloys or catalysis materials. But uh, as you will see later, as a high fraction of the materials that we consume are made by primary synthesis, we also have to deal with these synthesis methods. Do they include iron ore reduction or the use of scraps, for instance? Now, when we stay for a minute with the first aspect, namely the indirect sustainability measure that uh, works through providing materials that, for instance, uh, carry higher loads with uh, less mass and so on, and higher strength materials, then it's quite kind of uh, insightful to consider, for instance, as an example, that if you would build the Eiffel Tower today, it would require 75% uh, less steel for the same design. But if you see it a bit more generally, then you must bring these two aspects together, namely weight reduction as one aspect and also the CO2 reduction and energy reduction associated with the synthesis of the material. So that is what we call direct sustainability, while weight reduction refers to indirect sustainability effects. And here's an example when you take a nowadays SUV as an example, say it has 1.7 tons as weight and has a certain alloy mix to make the frame. Then the next step consists first in replacing these materials, of course, by high performance materials, so high strength steels or high strength aluminum alloys and so on. And by that you can often reduce uh, the weight of these vehicles by 400 or 500 kilograms. And compared to the body in white total costs, these additional costs are often quite moderate compared to the costs of the entire vehicle. But the second step is that you must now blend in making these high strength materials at lower CO2 emissions and lower energy costs. And that can be done, for instance, uh, by using higher scrap fractions or by synthesis, for instance, of the steels with uh, green power and hydrogen as a reductant. So I come back to this later. This is just an example of a case study where you can improve the product by the indirect effect of the weight reduction and by the direct effect that you consume less CO2 and energy when you make the material in the first place. Now when we take a somewhat broader look uh, and discuss the role of material science for a circular economy, then we have of course many access points. One is of course the efficiency in manufacturing. That means you can produce materials and manufacture them at much higher efficiency in digital workflows than before. Second is this, again, indirect effect that we can provide many advanced materials for the electrification of industry and transportation. Another aspect is that materials, of course, serve a lot indirectly to a better sustainability as they are sustainability enablers. So when you build windmills, solar cell absorbers, or uh, the grid, then you of course can uh, improve that a lot when you use corresponding advanced materials. Another aspect where you can save a lot of CO2 and energy is of course to not scrap the products in the first place. And that means we have to discuss providing materials for higher longevity and for a hydrogen economy. So corrosion research is one of the biggest aspects to consider. Another aspect that gets closer to our generic work is how to design materials for infinite recycling. This is very important. It is more at the core of material science that we have so many complex alloys nowadays. They are not always compatible with each other. That one alloy design task in the future is to make alloys that are made for recycling. But having said all that, 
we must appreciate that due to the enormous market growth, only about maybe two thirds of the entire market demand of advanced materials can be satisfy, satisfied in a perfectly circular approach and that due to market growth at least one third in the best of all worlds must be provided by primary resources. And that is a very important point to keep in mind because that is where the CO2 emissions are indeed created. Uh, that is also reflected by this uh, overview uh, that you see here. When you just compare the materials that we are mining every year, uh, then you again see that is reflected particularly again by steelmaking, where now 3 billion tons of ores are mined every year. And of course, there are many other uh, alloys for which similar effects apply, but steel is always the one with by far the biggest leverage. Now let's look deeper into steel today, of course. Um, and the global steel demand forecast suggests that by the year of 2050, we might encounter the gigantic amount of 2.8 billion tons of steels. And as the majority, the vast majority of the steel nowadays is from primary sources, primary minerals like iron oxide reduced by the use of carbon as a reductant, this translates to this production of CO2. So that's the main redox reaction that explains why steelmaking is associated with such a high greenhouse gas footprint. Now let's take a look briefly at the thermodynamics. So how much embodied energy do we talk? We have uh, about 6 mega megajoule per kilogram embodied in iron. That means this is the thermodynamic work that you uh, need to supply when you extract iron from its hematitic oxide. So that's also the minimum energy you, you need to make iron. In reality, in a steel factory, the conversion efficiency rates are, of course, only 20 to 30 percent, which is, by the way, for the world of metals, already extremely good. So steelmaking nowadays is already pretty efficient. Um, but you must blend in that the thermodynamic is thermodynamic uh, embodied energy is, of course, only the lower bound. Now, with these uh, introductory words, you can appreciate that steel stands not only for 7% of the global total energy consumption, but it also causes about 33% of the all industrial greenhouse gas emissions. And it's very important to really do basic research on the direct CO2 avoidance in that context. We have nowadays about 40,000 papers published every year on the scientific origin of climate change, which we know is tied to the CO2 emission. On the other hand, when it comes to directly avoid CO2, we have only 600 papers, for instance, on green steelmaking, although this has such a huge leverage, as I showed you before. That means there's a lot of headroom to do much more metallurgical uh, research on these aspects when you really want to avoid CO2 and not just describe how it acts on global warming. In this presentation, I talk particularly about the use of hydrogen for iron making. And this means, means, of course, that the corresponding redox reaction does no longer provide CO2, but water as a reactant. Now, when we take a somewhat systems view at these different aspects, you start with a feedstock. The feedstock can be, for instance, scrap, fine ores, pellets, and lump ores. And those can be exposed to different reduction reduction states, namely to electrons, molecules, protons, or ions. And this reduction can proceed by exposing the feedstock to these reductants in a different aggregate state, namely in a liquid state, in a solid state, in plasma form, and in gas form. So as you will see today, we will later mainly talk about plasma and gas-based uh, reduction methods. And then you can, of course, choose these uh, reductant agents coming in different form as methanol or methane, so natural gas, which is currently, for instance, a standard for the so-called direct reduction. But you can also think about using ammonia or, of course, pure hydrogen. Another alternative is loaded, unloaded uh, liquid organic hydrogen carriers, LOHC. So you have a variety of different gases which you can use to reduce in different aggregate states 
these different types of feedstocks. So that already creates a wide variety of possibilities um, for reducing iron oxide. And then you must of course consider where the corresponding gases are coming from. Does the hydrogen come from electrolysis? Does it come from steam reforming? Or is the ammonia coming from the Harbour Bosch? Or is the uh, hydrogen coming from pyrolysis processes and so on? So you must see the entire landscape behind the iron making process. And that goes even uh, wider. Uh, and you see in this system overview, you can see then it depends of course a lot from which sources you get the electrical energy to operate these corresponding reduction synthesis. And that can be nuclear, can come from variable grid usage, carbon-based or renewable sources. And all that must be seen together as a system science to pick the hottest topics to find your meandering pathway for real green steelmaking. Now the current standard, as we all no, and as I said, for about 70% of the steel production on the globe is the blast furnace plus converter route using carbon as reductant. And that produces about 2 tons CO2 per ton of iron, leading to the amounts of emissions that I've mentioned before. And the next step in engineering is now to use direct reduction uh, furnaces together with electric arc smelters. With that you can substantially reduce the CO2 emissions when you use hydrogen. Currently this direct reduction is operated with natural gas but is in principle feasible um, to accept instead also hydrogen. So direct reduction means you expose solid oxides to a reduction aggregate uh, uh, to a reduction in gas form. And from that you get the so-called iron sponge and this iron sponge is then charged into the electric arc furnace and is smelted. That means you have a solid state reduction process which in principle is rather slow because it depends on solid state diffusion. And you need two furnaces to operate such a plant. Now the more bold or the more disruptive approach is to do it all directly in one single furnace. So the idea that we have developed is to use an electric arc furnace but equip it with a minor hydrogen plasma. And depending on the electrode design that can lead to up to 100% less CO2 emissions. So the idea is shown here, you feed scrap different type of oxides and uh, hydrogen into such an electric arc plasma and then you ignite the plasma, uh, you ignite the arc and produce hydrogen plasma. And that can be done for relatively moderate amounts. We work with 3, 5, 10 and 8% hydrogen, very moderate amounts. And the advantage is that you melt and reduce the entire material plus the scrap in one single aggregate. And the mechanisms behind all of that are still entirely unknown. Now let's first talk a little bit about the so-called direct reduction where we expose solid oxides to hydrogen. Here you see a typical kinetic curve at 700 degrees centigrade under exposure of the oxide, hematite oxide, to pure hydrogen. And you see here that when you look at the reduction rate plotted against the reduction degree, you can see that the trigonal hematite is very rapidly transformed into cubic martensite and further into the wüstite, which is FeO. However, the wüstite to iron transformation, to BCC iron transformation, is very, very sluggish. In the last half, it's nearly in order of magnitude slower than the initial reduction. And a reason for that can be seen here. That is a very nice example of an uh, in situ transmission electron microscopy experiment, which has been conducted by my colleague Professor Mark Willinger at the ETH in Zurich. And you can see that from this area here in the center, uh, which is the wüstite, you can see how this is overgrown by the actual iron that forms here in the electron microscope when you expose it to hydrogen. The same is shown here at a slightly higher resolution. You can see here, again, the coarse surface in the middle or here. And then you can see how the iron is starting to grow on top of this. So it's kind of a core shell type of system which you are forming. And when we plot this schematically, you see that you have then here the wüstite as the oxide. And you have on top of it now this rather dense iron layer that has been formed. 
and the oxygen must now diffuse outbound towards the next nearest surface. And at the surface it can recombine with hydrogen to form the water molecule which is then transported away. So this solid state diffusion is the sluggish part of the reaction, particularly if you have such a core shell type of structure. Now let's take a look at such a hematite uh, at the beginning of the reduction. Here you see that after the sintering you have a complex polycrystalline aggregate with lots of inherited porosity that you see here and here. Also you can see that of course the ore already comes with some other oxides like for instance magnesium oxide but also silicon and calcium occur. Now after one minute exposure to hydrogen at 700 degrees centigrade you can see how the magnetite which is shown here in the golden color for instance or here is growing into the surrounding hematite which is shown here in blue. And you see from this EBSD map here that this comes at a very strongly refined microstructure. So you have a classical nucleation and growth process of this transformation where the nucleation really starts at all the free surface area where the oxygen, water and hydrogen transports are the fastest. However, when you now look at uh, the 10 minutes at 700 degree, then you see that the evolving microstructure is not a simple core shell microstructure where the oxide is surrounded by iron, but it's much more complicated. You can see here from these different snapshots that you have ferrite formation, of course, around all the pores where the hydrogen, uh, where the water can be formed easily and removed. Uh, but you see also these patches with wustite in the center and ferrite on the perimeter, ferrite around it. But you can see here from these cracks, for instance, or here, that these uh, cracks and lamination areas do not surround, uh, uh, that the ferrite does not surround the wustite entirely, but you have these cracks and pores that form. When you look uh, close to an interface, then you see dense populations also of dislocations here in the electron channeling contrast image, which has to do with a very high volume mismatch between the two faces. And here you see also that in the remaining wustite, which is shown here, you have massive increase of porosity because of this atomic mass loss of the oxygen. Now when we look now at 30 minutes at 700 degrees centigrade and blow this maybe up a little bit towards higher magnification, you can then indeed see that at the late stages the wustite is becoming more and more densely surrounded indeed by ferrite. That means whenever you want to shrink that wustite further, you must diffuse the oxygen through these dense iron layers. So that makes this process so very sluggish. You can see that also this porosity is changing as a function of the reduction time. Again, we are at 700 degree centigrade. And you can see that you have this acquired porosity, which is often not percolating, but isolated pores. And then you can see that the porosity increases from about 25% to nearly 50% at the end of the reduction after two hours. So this just shows you how this pore structure and percolation goes on. Here's an example of a wustite single crystal where we just study the difference between the surface and the center of the material. And you can see that at the surface the porosity is nearly vanished because the gas can evade towards the free surface, while in the center the gas, the water that is formed, is starting to fill up all these internal inner pores. Another very interesting aspect is that these gradients also translate to the pellet level. You see here the pellet surface at the top and you see the pellet center here. And this is an ongoing in situ study by Jan Ma using in situ synchrotron uh, diffraction, XRD diffraction. And the take home message here from this pellet that even after 30 minutes at 700 degrees centigrade, you have on the outside a nearly complete reduction of the material into alpha iron. So the process is completed. Well, when you go more closer to the center in the pellet center, you see that most of the material is still in oxide state. That means there's a huge gradient between the surface and the center of the pellet. And from that you can draw conclusions about the size and shape of the pellets you want. When you translate this into such an overview picture, 
uh, taken from a paper that has just appeared in Scripta Materialia last week. As an overview of the viewpoint paper, you see when this is your palette, you have through that palette these gradients in the reduction state. And this is something you have to consider and feed in into the actual reactor, for instance, for such a hydrogen-based direct reduction reactor. So this must be considered for the design of these processes. And it must be considered quantitatively. That means we take such a pellet, we cut it open. Here you have a half section of the pellet. And then we walk step by step again through the microstructure of this pellet. You can study the corresponding phases as you see here. You can study all the grain boundaries as you see here in blue from the EBSD maps. And then you can, of course, take the next step and uh, see how this looks like after proceeding a reduction, as we have discussed before. And then we translate this into a corresponding simulation. So this is from my colleagues Yang Bai and Java Mian Rudi, a phase field calculation. What this phase field calculation is doing, it translates the microstructure and the phase transformation and the mass transport into a generalized uh, Allen Kahn and Kahn Hilliard type of calculation. And with that, you are able to really track how the hydrogen, the oxygen, and the water is forming, where it is forming, how it is removed. But you can also very nicely show how the formation of the iron here, shown essentially in yellow, is really proceeding. While well, these are the open pores through which the hydrogen and, uh, can enter and the water can be removed. So this is now a simulation of the iron compared here to this picture. So we arrive at a quantitative uh, uh, description of these processes. Now just a few slides on hydrogen plasma. Plasma is a state where you render a gas into an ionized state, as you know it from lightning during a storm. So here is again a principal figure about the process that we use. We use a single electric arc furnace. We charge it with scrap, iron oxide and hydrogen and ignite. That means we have something like a thermomix where you do the mixing, melting, alloying, reduction, electrification, use all feedstocks and homogenization all in a single furnace in future. And that could be in principle also operated by green sustainable power. So that is kind of the core idea. And here are the individual steps for this idea. So you can use all kinds of iron feedstock. You can also use partially reduced oxide, for instance, from direct reduction. Then you replace the carbon as a reductant uh, by hydrogen. And that hydrogen can come in different gas forms, be it hydrogen, ammonia, or LOHC, or others. Then you charge it into electric arc furnace. These furnaces are existing. They can be operated with sustainable electricity and they can be modified to operate under a partial pressure of hydrogen below 10%. And this is all you need. And when you ignite the arc, you create from that hydrogen a plasma state, an ionized plasma state. And that is doing the melting and the reduction in one operation in one furnace with the highest possible emission reduction of CO2. And this Percentage, of course, depends on the design of an electrode or if you need further heating. So that brings the highest hydrogen and energy efficiency of all steel making possibilities. It is compatible with existing technologies. It is suited for mass production, so very high quantities. And however, you need still a lot of basic science research to understand these processes. Here's just an example from our laboratory. And here you have the ignition state at the ore. Here you have an intermediate quench state, and here you have the final state. And then we study again the microstructures and the composition, even down to the atomic scale. So in a somewhat small overview diagram, you see that we have a multi-scale, but also a multi-physics process here. That means we have to include the type and granularity of the feedstock. We have to consider the impurities, for instance, in terms of silicon, manganese, and calcium. We have to study all the nucleation and growth processes. Here you see nicely how the alpha iron grows into the surrounding wüstite that is of course quenched from such a state. Then you have all the transport phenomena that you need to understand. Transport and partitioning phenomena here just exemplary shown for the silicon from such a type of atom probe experiment. And you need to study all the thermodynamics. So which oxides, which you know impurity dependent oxides and so on are you forming. So lots of research to do. So with that, I stop here. 
And I have a few conclusions, but also many, many open questions. So you saw pertaining to the direct reduction, the role of microstructure for kinetics, many questions pertaining to thermodynamics of the phase transformation. So in principle, the science of phase transformation after such chemically driven boundary conditions is a very new research topic. Another question is, where are all the reaction partners? The hydrogen, the water, the oxygen, where do they go? Where do they assemble? How do you get rid of the water in a reactor, for instance? Very important. Then you have seen the entire area of pores and cracks, all the open volume uh, and the percolation. Even charge vacancies are an interesting topic. Then we have shown a glimpse of the simulation, chemomechanical simulation, because you have these huge volume changes and the role of impurities in nanochemistry. On the plasma side, there's uh, so much to do um, on the solid plasma interaction, but also uh, plasma liquid interactions. And of course, lots of new experiments and theories from in situ methods towards advanced uh, simulation methods. And with, I, with that, I thank you very, very much for your kind attention. Thank you.